This month, only in Artifacts, we'll explore the world of TV production, visual art, comic sensibilities, and songs from the heart. Don't go away now, you hear? Hello and welcome to Artifacts, the show that talks about the arts in the Minneapolis area. I'm Phil Lindsay. And I'm Janet Zahn. And we're going to start with some news. Now the Minneapolis Committee on Urban Environment, known as Q, is busy these days. They're taking a lead role in Mayor uh, Sharon Sales Belton's Minneapolis Beautiful Initiative. One of Q's subcommittees, uh, the Neighborhood Environment Committee, every year sponsors the Blooming Boulevard Awards program. That's for flower gardens visible to the passing public. Now in the last few years that program has expanded tremendously. Uh, they had uh, 400 nominations for beautiful uh, gardens in 1996. That grew to 631 last year. By the end of July this year, city staff have received 1,055 nominations for Blooming Boulevards. By the way, nearly 50 citizens have been selected and trained to serve as garden judges for that contest. Year one of the Minnesota Film Board's Jobs Fund initiative was a resounding success. The Jobs Fund rebates 5% of Minnesota production expenditures up to $100,000 per feature film or long form project. In fiscal year 1998, payments totaling 259000 were made to 10 productions, which in turn brought more than $8,900,000 to the state. This represents a dramatic increase in production revenues over 97, and the Jobs Fund is viewed as the main reason for the turnaround. Now, for you book lovers, or cyber surfers for that matter, this next piece of news might be of interest. Amazon.com, that's the online bookstore, now is the country's third largest bookseller. This is a company founded only four years ago. And of course, independent bookstores already facing heavy challenges from the big chain booksellers are wary of this new way to browse for books. By the way, Amazon.com stock, uh, just to give you an example, started trading at $45 a share in early June. By the end of July, it was up to $120. And that's the news. And now for some views of insider art, uh, including the second annual Amicus Prison Art Exhibition on display through August 13th at the Minneapolis College of Art and Design Gallery. And right after your inside look at insider art, I'll welcome my first guest, Ron Shera, executive producer of the outdoor magazine show Minnesota Bound, and Georgiana Day, who is a production coordinator focusing on the television industry for the Minnesota Film Board. Ron and Georgiana will give us some clues as to why and how Minnesota is fast becoming a hotbed for television production. Indeed. Then next, I'll be welcoming Kay Ruain, an accomplished visual artist, followed by Colleen Cruz, who is widely regarded as one of the Twin Cities' best storytellers and comedians. And you'll want to stay with us for our musical guest, Diane Wegner, who will be singing for you right here on our shoe. But first, <laughs> as promised, some thoughts from one of the artists featured in the Insider Art Exhibition at MCAD. Art is very humanizing. Art really gets people to strive and think. I see magic happen in these art classes. I see people who have never had a success in their life unless it was violent learn that they can, that they can try, that they can struggle, that they can improve and succeed. I see, I see things happen in here that are, that, that are uh, like flowers blooming. Really, it really is, is miraculous. And hello everybody, I'm Janet Zahn, and welcome to the August edition of Artifacts. My first guests today are Georgiana Day. And Georgiana, you are working on the television production world for the Minnesota Film Board. Welcome. Thank you. And Ron Shera, who is executive producer of Minnesota Bound, which is also known as Backroads with Ron and Raven on ESPN. Correct. And then you have another version called Call of the Wild on the Outdoor Channel. That's right. We Welcome. repackage all of those. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Welcome. Thank Glad you could be here. We're going to talk about television in Minnesota today. And Ron, I want to just start with you first. You are executive producer of a very successful cable television program. And I want to know how you did it. Where did you start? How did you get the idea? Well, I started in a newspaper, actually. Mm -hmm. Wrote an outdoor column for a long time. And I was approached, uh, dabbled in television, but I was approached about seven, eight years ago by Carol Evan. Uh, wanting to know if I would be interested in producing or appearing in some two-minute news stories about the outdoors. 
Most uh, television news programs don't uh, do a lot with hunting, fishing, camping, hiking, that kind of thing. So this particular news director liked those topics and so I auditioned for that and that started Minnesota Bound as a two-minute feature. Mm -hmm. And uh, they became popular with the viewers and then we were going to segue into a half-hour show on CARE 11. And, uh, but the station manager at that time looked at the numbers and said, I don't know if we can swing this or not. But then he proposed to me that maybe I should try producing the half-hour show. Uh -huh. And uh, CARE 11 would uh, uh, help me do it and actually buy the show from me. And uh, so that's how Minnesota Bound mm -hmm. became, and then mm -hmm. it became very popular. Mm -hmm. Now we're into our fourth year. Wow, that's tremendous. Um, tell me just a little bit about how now you have gotten Minnesota Bound into these various, um, the, the other networks on ESPN. And well, Minnesota Bound, uh, as you know, is a, va a magazine variety show. Uh, we do everything from hunting to hiking and nature, bird watching. Mm -hmm. And uh, at first I thought I would be uh, perhaps too general for the hardcore hunter <laughs> angler or perhaps too h hardcore for the person that's a casual outdoor enthusiast, but I discovered because of the mix, I was getting both viewers. So mm -hmm. I had this um, a new sort of approach to outdoor programming. It wasn't another fishing show. You know, we're going to catch a bass <laughs> on a white spinnerbait here today, folks. Yeah. Um, and because I own the show, the next thing, um, uh, timing's everything. You had the Outdoor Channel, which is a, you know, a big explosion of cable right. all across the country, and they needed programming. So. This, was, this is, in fact, still is an opportune time to be a television producer because there are a lot of outlets for your work and there's a lot of demand for, for good programming. Mm -hmm. So the next thing I knew, I, I got on the Outdoor Channel. Actually, we're on Duluth, Rochester, mm -hmm. shortly going to have, be in Fargo, mm -hmm. and um, uh, we're in Chicago. So slowly this is increasing. Well, then our work got noticed by a, a producer for ESPN. Mm -hmm. And uh, the next thing I knew, they asked us to produce some two-minute features mm -hmm. for ESPN. Mm -hmm. Now, what you don't know, perhaps, Janet, and this is a very fast wrap here, mm -hmm. but uh, uh, starting in January, I'll have a half-hour show on ESPN2 mm -hmm. called Backroads with Ron and Raven. And, of mm -hmm. course, Raven is the star of this whole thing. You, you, should, you should really have the dogs <laughs> I should. Here. I know. We should have asked him. Right. But, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. So it's been a fun, uh, a fun mm -hmm. experience for me going from newspaper to television. Mm -hmm. But I want to say this while Georgiana is mm -hmm. here, and that mm -hmm. is, I could not have done this show if I hadn't been in Minnesota. I'm convinced. Maybe Wisconsin, but if I lived in Indianapolis, Indiana, Indiana I don't think we could have done this show. Uh, Minnesota is blessed with, a tr of course, a tremendous variety of natural resources mm -hmm. and a tremendous variety of people who, whose lifestyles and their lives are enriched by all of these various things. And, mm -hmm. and we're just tapping into that. I mean, snowmobiling and hiking and, and birds and wilderness and wolves and lakes and fishing and with Canada nearby as a playground, with the Dakotas as sure. prairies, Iowa and its corn and pheasants and, and I mean, the Great Lakes. Mm -hmm. It's that's all good, right here. It's a natural place yes, to be doing is. this. Yes, it is. And that, that's certainly true in terms of our locations, but we're also getting to be known nationally as a place that has an incredible crew base mm -hmm. and also uh, facilities and really just an easy place to produce television. Mm -hmm. And for somebody like me, you know, I have to do some selling, getting sponsors for the ESPN part of my career here. Right. And, and of course, I'm sitting with a, a tremendous source of advertising agencies mm -hmm. who are dealing with national companies companies looking for national uh, positioning in their ads and of course I can call and say hey, I'm from Minnesota bound and they know who I am so that's an advantage too. That is true. Georgiana you just started to touch on a little bit of what's happening here in the state obviously Ron's show is a wonderful example of, of the boom in television production. Tell us a little bit about um, your job at the film board, what you're doing and what you see as the broad as you know kind of your broad perspective of the industry and in the state? Well, the film board, you know, uh, initially has done a lot of work primarily with feature films and bringing out-of-state productions to the state. Mm -hmm. uh, but increasingly, we're aware, as everyone is, of the burgeoning television market, and we're really getting to be known nationally as a place to look to for good programming. 
And you see now in our state uh, a full range of types of programs. We mm -hmm. have children's, we have how-to, we have outdoor, we mm -hmm. have fiction. We, we really cover the broad bases. Mm -hmm. and, um, and so we've got House and Garden, we've got Hearst, we've got <laughs> Discovery, we've got ESPN, all looking towards this state as a place to, mm -hmm. to get great programming. Mm -hmm. so, the per so the perception of this, of Minnesota as a place mm -hmm. to shoot, mm -hmm. is clearly, a, we have a tremendous reputation. Exactly. Mm -hmm. uh, we had uh, we did a television seminar in May, mm -hmm. and one of the guests that we brought in to talk with uh, our people was uh, Robert Reedy, who's uh, an executive with Discovery Network. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And he said, uh, "We know it can be done in this state. We hire producers here. We hire crew here. The ideas are already here. So, and sometimes they're beginning now even to bring uh, the ideas here and say we want to do." you know, a kid's game show, mm -hmm. will you produce it from this place? Mm -hmm. We're also relatively uh, inexpensive place to, to produce television, mm -hmm. so that's a factor as well. Mm -hmm. As we're talking about this, I think this might be a nice point to show an example, Ron, of uh, a clip from one of your uh, shows that you did. This is a winter essay. I had to slip it in in the middle of summer. <laughs> I just thought it was, a, it was a lovely piece that you did, and it shows a little bit how, you know, what a unique approach you take to your show. Um, let's roll the clip. Nature seasons, if the truth were known, really don't change at all. They ooze. One season slowly oozes into another. So it is winter often arrives, one snowflake, one ice crystal at a time. Until at last, the land has a new coat of nature's own water-based paint. Winter, they say, is nature's time out. True enough, Mighty trees stand naked, and the lush grasses of summer lie dead and buried. And most of our feathered friends are long gone now, except for a few. Why some birds stay the course while others fly south is still a mystery. A blue jay, it seems to me, would be a happier bird by going where robins go. Not so for the gray jay. Of all birds, the whiskey jack is a symbol of the north a resident who seems at home amid a little ice and snow. Maybe that's why in such frozen solitude the gray jay is a friendly welcome wagon in feathers. Other wildlife residents cope in their own way. White-tailed deer wear insulated coats of hair during winter. Still others go to sleep. For six months they'll snooze until spring. But not squirrels. Squirrels sleep through cold snaps, but they seem to enjoy winter and the game of raiding backyard bird feeders. But when it comes to winter survival, Minnesotans may have the best game plan of them all. As Charles Peralt once wrote, it was cold out there, bitter, biting, cutting, piercing, and there were all those Minnesotans running around outdoors, happy as lambs in the spring. Still others find that winter is a time to reflect, reflect on who we are and what we do and how we fit into all we see around us. We also know that this season too shall pass. As it's been said, no winter lasts forever and no spring skips its turn. Well, Ron, that's a lovely piece. Well, you know, thank you. I appreciate mm -hmm. that, but I'm not sure I, I want winter back that fast. <laughs> well, I'm not either, but you know, it was just, I, I saw that and I said, you know, it makes me feel okay about winter. Yes. Uh, and beautifully written, too. Well, thank you. I appreciate thank your you. writing on that. Georgiana, before we go, I just wanted you to talk a little bit about what you what's in the future for the film board in terms of working with those folks who are producing television, where you see that going, and also maybe we can give people a number to call. Sure. Mm -hmm. Well, there are several components to what the film board would like to do. Um, first of all, there's the obvious one of education. We have had a television seminar. We plan on continuing to do so mm -hmm. for all the people who have ideas and, and uh, want to learn how to pitch those ideas, um, how to budget, how to talk to the, kind of, the right people. Mm -hmm. um, we also want to really act as a resource for the number of people who are in town who themselves don't get an opportunity to network. There are a lot of people in town who are so busy they don't have the opportunity to know who else is out there producing what. 
Um, we also are encouraging television people increasingly to get involved with uh, listing in our production guide, which is used hugely throughout the film community and somewhat in the television community, but increasingly we want to make sure that professionals are, are listing with us so that they know how to reach other professionals in the community. And in the fall, we plan on doing another television seminar, possibly dealing with um, well, two things we've talked about, either really a hands-on how to take something from an idea stage all the way through to selling it. Mm -hmm. uh, and also we've talked about a pitch panel, uh, mm -hmm. having people come in and have experts uh, who are decision makers about programming and have them be able to pitch their idea and, and then have the experts tell them how to form it more effectively mm -hmm. so that it actually gets sold. All right. I've been to one of those uh, at the NAPTI yeah. National. Oh, and, yeah. Uh, I, I think that's a tremendous idea because I think you could get uh, some general managers from stations uh, in this area, have uh, budding producers make their pitch, and who knows. I, I think the lesson here uh, and the message is there's always room for good programming in television. And, uh, but there's an emphasis on the word good. Uh, mm -hmm. Jerry McInnes, who produces all of the ESPN Saturday morning outdoor things, or puts them together, I should right. say, he told me he gets hundreds of tapes a month from would-be fishing show producers. <laughs> and, uh, and they're often not, they're not entertainment, they're not informative, mm -hmm. and so he sends them back. But they get the message that somehow they just didn't catch a fish that was big enough this time. <laughs> And that's not the problem. That's not it. That's right. not it. And hopefully, as we uh, as we move into this uh, field a little bit more in the state, people will become uh, a little more more adept at doing the pitch, which you've probably perfected by now. Mm -hmm. uh, Georgiana, quickly, we just need to give the phone yes. number for the hotline. Yes, the Minnesota Film Board does have a hotline on which we uh, we put job listings, we put events that mm -hmm. are related to both the film and television world, and the number is 333-0436. One more time. 333-0436. <laughs> and you can call there weekly because it's changed and updated on a weekly basis, mm -hmm. and uh, it's, a good, it's a good way of finding out what's going on mm -hmm. in the community. Well, that's it. That's all we have time for. I appreciate both of you coming in to talk with us about this. Uh, congratulations, Ron, on your work. Thank you. My Georgiana, pleasure. good luck. I hope things continue to grow and uh, blossom in our state in television production. Thanks for having this rock here, too. Hey, yeah. We wanted to make you feel at home. <laughs> <laughs> Next up, Phil welcomes visual artist Kay Ruane right after a look at another locally produced television show that's now in syndication across the country. Here's a clip from Rebecca's Garden. If you've ever tried to grow corn in your own backyard, you may have found that your harvest has been less than desirable. It's probably because your corn didn't get pollinated. On farms like this, where we have rows and rows of corn, pollination is not a problem. The pollen gets blown all over the place. Well, to ensure good pollination in your backyard, it's important to, well, take Mother Nature into your own hands. So what you need to do is hand pollinate your corn. The first step is to watch the silk. This is where the corn cob develops. When you get a full brush of silk, then you're ready to pollinate. You can find the pollen in the tassel. It's important to come out early in the morning on a dry day to collect the pollen. Gently bend the tassel into a plastic or glass jar. Shake the tassel, and very soon you'll see a fine yellow powder which will collect at the bottom. That's the pollen. Once you've collected the pollen from the tassels of corn, the next step is to get a paintbrush or a cotton swab. Then we're going to apply the pollen to the corn silks. It's important to cover each thread of silk because that is going to help fertilize the egg, which turns out to be the kernel of corn. If you miss one thread, that means you'll have an ear of corn missing kernels. Now for guaranteed results, it's a good idea to hand pollinate at least twice. And remember, there's only one week in the summer in which conditions are just right. So remember, if you hand pollinate, it will grow. Well, Rebecca's Garden, starring Rebecca Coles, is produced in Minnesota by Lori Fink. And that beautiful corn scene you just saw was shot outside of Afton, Minnesota, one of many beautiful Minnesota locations featured on that show. 
kind of looked like the corn in my backyard, actually. Now, on with the show. I'd like to welcome my next guest, artist Kay Ruane. Kay, it's nice to have you here. It's nice to be here. Now, nice. we haven't met before, but I've been hearing a lot about you. You've been accomplishing a lot with your art, um, State Arts Board, what, Fellowship, I think? That's right. Last year? Yeah, artist Fellowship year. last year. And mm -hmm. then a McKnight Award recently. Uh, Congratulations. Yeah. Thank you. Pretty good. Thanks. Now, how does that happen? I mean, you've been creating art, obviously, for some years. You studied mm -hmm. art, I assume. Mm -hmm. How do people hear about you to do that, to give you these awards and this recognition? You apply for them, okay. essentially. You, you know, they have a procedure, and you mm -hmm. hand in slides and, and see they, what happens. And then and they have a panel that looks at you and about 8,000 other people, That's probably. right, yeah, yeah, something like Has that. Has it changed your life as an artist? Uh, yeah, definitely. It, it is so great to have that kind of um, confirmation, that, mm -hmm. that feeling of support. And that's what I think is amazing about Minnesota is that it's just so good to be an artist here because they have that. It's like in this area they respect artists in a way that they don't other places and I've lived to many other places. I was going to ask, so you speak from some experience? Yeah. Well, without naming exact you know, no. corners, but I mean what other parts of the country have you lived in? Um, out east, yeah. um, south. Okay. Mm -hmm. And certainly New York is considered a, a hotbed of art, but sure. are you suggesting that they don't sort of focus on supporting the working artist as much? I don't know. I've never actually lived in New York. Oh. Um, I think that Minnesota is unique in, in all of these programs, though. I mean, you get a great studio spaces that's affordable, you know, through art space. There's RCA here in town, Resources, Resources and, and counseling. counseling for the Arts. I mean, I have never seen any of that in any other city where you feel so welcome. Mm -hmm. and, and it sounds like you make use of these then. Sure, oh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's important to be aware of what's out there, and I still am learning what's out there. Um, <laughs> well, in a minute or two, we're going to see some images that you were nice enough to bring, some slides of some of your work. Mm -hmm. Where did you get your training? Where did you start out? I started in a um, small college, Edgewood um, College in Madison. I don't Madison. know. In, in yeah. Madison? Wisconsin. Okay, no, that's yeah. my hometown. Really? Really, Edgewood. Oh, out on the yeah. edge of town, I bet. It, I think. Yeah. <laughs> it didn't feel like it was in So are you town. from Madison, or you decided no, they had the I'm, school you wanted to go to? I'm from um, outside of Chicago, Mount Prospect. Oh, sure. And um, Edgewood, uh, I stayed there one year and transferred to the Art Institute in Chicago. Okay. Um, and then I transferred once again to University of Illinois in Champaign, down in the cornfields, mm -hmm. um, because I wanted to study medical art, medical illustration, yeah. which I did for a time. Does that inform the art you're still doing? I think it does. Because I read somewhere it's, that you do, um, I don't want to say anatomical stuff, but you use the yeah, figure a lot in, I in, do. in your work. Yeah. yeah, but that's somewhat new. Yeah. Um, I was doing still lifes in the 80s, uh, wow. very brightly colored still lifes, so totally different than what I'm doing. Well, tell you what, let's take a look at these slides that you brought, and then we'll okay. talk more about your career and all this sort of stuff. Sure. So why don't you just start okay. us off with the first one you brought. Okay, um, the first one is called Caldera. And um, these are all figures that are in uh, various environments around the world, really. Um, here she's sitting in a volcano uh, that is Mount Kilauea. And I have traveled quite extensively um, over the years, but uh, this one I accompanied my husband on a um, documentary that he did on volcanoes. So we always talked about volcanoes, and it's really funny how that permeates, you know, both my work and his work. Very so, interesting. Yeah. So and this she's one, sitting in this uh, volcano. volcano. And psychology behind her, <laughs> I guess you could say that. Um, behind her, uh, she's holding a water lily that's spontaneously combusting. Um, there's flames whipping out yeah, of so it. So there's a dimension so, to this work, Kay, yeah, I can tell. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you could call it uh, maybe some elements of magic realism and so forth. But I think essentially all of this work is um, starts from a personal basis. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then the next one is called Forest. I keep the titles very simple um, mm -hmm. because I want them to be uh, open to interpretation. Mm -hmm. So, Well, describe uh, uh, Forest a little bit. Forest, this woman is again holding the same water lily and it might be spontaneously combusting or just emitting some kind of a fog or something. Mm -hmm. um, and they, I'm not sure while I'm doing it what what's actually going to happen there. Mm -hmm. um, there's always something kind of um, mystical or mysterious happening in the drawings, and oftentimes it's through the process that I discover what exactly is going to happen. Um, Interesting. It's, it's almost like you, you get into a trance-like state and things start happening. Um, so it's really exciting. I know that you sometimes yeah. describe this in very passionate ways, your approach to art or mm -hmm. your, your inspiration for it. Yeah. Very interesting. Yeah. 
Nice. And the next one is called Cypress, and that's um, actually these are cypresses in Napa Valley. Um, the the light uh, that's coming through them I uh, made up um, through that process I just described, um, and the the poppies weren't there. I had I had decided she had to be in a field of poppies. Um, probably, be, well, my first thought was the Wizard of Oz and how they fall asleep in the field of poppies mm -hmm. and nice how image. there's the drug connotation and this feeling of, you know, she's playful but there's this danger lurking behind her, maybe in the form of the cypresses or something. Um, but again, I want it to be open to interpretation. Someone else may read this totally differently right. and their reading is just as important as mine, you know. Um, That's interesting that, that audience plays a role for you, not only yeah. while you're doing it, but after you've finished your work, it's out there and then they interpret it the way they want. That's right. And you wouldn't yeah. feel bad then if somebody came up with an entirely different interpretation? I would feel good. You would feel good, okay. Yeah, I'd feel real good. Um, I, uh, yeah, I, I learned a lot by taking writing classes and about narrative and about the feeling of audience that I never really had in my art training because audience wasn't discussed like it it's is as a writer. It's an interesting cross-disciplinary approach. I haven't heard yeah. that from a lot of visual artists, for instance, the storytelling aspect. That's right. Good for yeah. you. I'm, I'm really interested in that now. Um, this is called Badlands. Um, my husband and I went there and um, took photographs that I found quite useful in my work. Uh, and um, here she has a cabbage. And there's always some kind of magical um, thing in it that, that I feel is magical that's glowing or, or something interesting and strange is happening and of course it's probably quite symbolic and so forth but I don't want to be too aware of what the symbols mean because then they become stale and mm. you know so forth. I like to, to work from a kind of a instinctive mm -hmm. place. And almost indirect a little bit. Yeah. It comes and then exactly. you work off of that. Exactly. And um, I actually saw this, I saw a cabbage uh, while I was shopping in Byerly's in yeah. the person's cart that was in front of me. And you recognized it. <laughs> no, it just, it, I guess Byerly's has wonderful lighting and it just looked like it was glowing and I thought, I've got to get me, me one of these. <laughs> I think I you should lead Dolson of towards the Byerly's cave. You should get <laughs> yeah. out there and say, from an artist's point of view, this is the vegetable section at Byerly's. I mean, it's amazing what you can, if you open your eyes, what you can see around you, even Fair in enough. Byerly's. Yeah. Um, it's, the produce section is amazing. <laughs> <laughs> Magical I realism. I can wander That's around good. for days. I would like to go to the farmer's section. market with you someday and just see what your impression is of these <laughs> rutabagas. And now, um, uh, this is my most recent piece, and it's called Cave. And this one, um, there's an animal here, as you can see. Uh -huh. And animals have been um, starting to show up in my work. I was going to say, this is a um, new development. It is, yeah. In fact, in the last one that I'm not showing, um, called Beach, uh, this woman is crouched on a beach um, looking at some, some smoking kind of thing, uh, mysterious thing. And then behind her are these two dolphins. And one seems to be on the attack to the other, or possibly. And the other is playing unaware of this um, attack. And um, and I think, too, that has something to do with it, that the animals, and they were real tiny, but here now this huge elk and... Um, <laughs> Creating a little more uh, uh, presence in your, uh, That's right. in your work here. Yeah, and what's fun about these, too, um, is that they surprise me. And that's another thing I learned in writing was just to sit down and do what's called free writing. And that is, you know, just sit down and write the first thing that comes to your head and don't worry about misspellings and so forth. And so that's kind of the way I come up with these images. They, they come up real fast, just in my head. And, and occasionally, you know, I, I of course tweak them for, for various reasons, mm -hmm. compositionally and so forth. But Is it hard to I capture like them if fresh? they come up that fast? Is it hard to get home. I, when I'm writing, I sometimes the ideas come so much faster than I can actually write it down. Is that that's right? And um, it is fast, and I don't want to write it down because if it survives a few days, then it's a good image, ah, and that's sort of my test. Test of time. That's right. Yeah, okay. and I always have a lot of images in line in my head, and and I always picture them so, sort of impatient, waiting. And um, then, of course, a new image comes up that, that seems much more appropriate, and it pushes its, itself in, ahead in line and kind of pisses off the other one. <laughs> <laughs> now, do you push yourself ahead in the line at Byerly's? You say, I want that cabbage. That's my cabbage. I'm painting that thing. So, okay, I want to read a quote here. Okay. Um, you're quoted uh, as saying, I remember making collages from magazine bits my mother placed in my crib. Mm -hmm. You've got to yeah. talk about that. You, how, I mean, how old were you when you're making collages? This is like prodigy stuff. I, 
<laughs> well, um, and you I couldn't, really you couldn't have been more than a year or two, could yeah. you? And you're, you're putting bits of magazines. Mm -hmm. I think it, really it was sort of a, a way to keep me quiet, kind of like people show kids' videos. Well, that may things, be from your mother's point of view, yeah. but if she put stuff in my crib, I would have been mm -hmm. gumming them up. You're making actual <laughs> artwork? That's amazing. Uh, yeah, it was, it was fun. In fact, my mom actually did participate in the process quite a bit, because once I came up with something, she would glue it together and show it to me, yeah. and then we had a scrapbook. And well, so you still have these images? Uh, I don't know. I should or your mom should, mom. somewhere. Yeah, I think she does. She keeps everything. Yeah. So. Yeah. Um, whenever I get a working artist, especially one who's accomplished and is, is thoughtful about what she's doing, I mm -hmm. want to ask a question like this. Okay. Are you seeing trends in in your medium in, in in the visual arts field I mean are there is there a new focus on certain kinds of things to tell or a new focus on audience or mm -hmm. what's going on in the field that oh, you're sensing that's an awfully big question I can think of a lot of things yeah to talk anything about. that comes to mind um, I I like the fact that narrative, uh, maybe I'm picking up on people using narrative more in their work. Um, and maybe, of course, it's always existed. But um, you know, people like Carrie Mae Weems, who's a, a photographer who uses narrative. Um, Eric Fischel, of course, has for years. Uh, I, I'm also really encouraged by realism sh showing up again in sort of a new way, in, in a deeper way. Um, than it has in the past, and there's a new respect for it. And a lot of the galleries in New York and other places are showing really good realists. And um, okay. I'm, I'm really encouraged about that. Well, that's, that's good, because I like to find out mm -hmm. what, what maybe we can expect to see a little bit more of. So that's, mm -hmm. that's good insight. Yeah. Kay, we've just run out of time. It's been a pleasure to meet you, to have you on the show, and to see some Thank images you. of your artwork. Okay. Continued good luck. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Now, up next, storyteller and comedian extraordinaire Colleen Cruz. But first, let's take a look at a clip from a video called Tiger Jack, Mr. Respect. This comes to us from uh, Mr. Ford's sixth graders at Capitol Hill School in St. Paul, and also from Media Mike, that's Mike Hazard. Now, in the clip, students give their uh, interpretation of words of wisdom from Tiger Jack, whose business has been a mainstay at the corner of Dale and I-94 for a number of years. Stay tuned. Tiger Jack says a lot of things that make you think. When Tiger Jack says, don't be no deadbeat, no yes man, no get by, he means don't be lazy, have your own opinions, and do everything to the best of your ability. Let your word be your word. When Tiger Jack says this, he means tell the truth and stand by it. This, I believe, is very important to Tiger Jack. I wear the same clothes and say the same things to everyone. I believe this means that he doesn't treat anyone differently or more special than anyone else. I think what Tiger means when he says, if one person broke it, another could fix it, is that if when one person does something wrong, another can fix it by doing something right. On Dale in St. Anthony stands a small brown and blue shack where an old wise man works. Written on an old first class envelope is a petition about his sidewalk. His customers all sign, talking about how clean and clear his sidewalk always is. Signatures from all races, cultures, and people are on his envelope. It all started when someone claimed Tiger didn't keep the sidewalk clear. Now he has the proof, if anyone asks. Well, that was a sweet piece, and if you get a chance, I might recommend you go over and sign that darn petition over there. Sounds like a good thing. Well, my next guest is Colleen Cruz. Some of you may have heard of her. She's uh, reputed to be one of the best, the hottest comedians and storytellers in the cities. Thanks for being here. It's nice to have you here. In fact, the fact of the matter is, you were recently back, earlier this summer, from a big showcase deal, a great big international thing in Montreal. That's right, the Just for Laughs Comedy Festival. Just for Laughs, which is a, a launching pad for, like, big league people, and you killed. I killed. I yeah. slayed him. Yeah, I, I did very well. I did. I did our hometown uh, proud. That's yeah. great. Well, describe briefly for those of us who have never been to that event. I mean, they bring in people from like all over, right? They bring in people from all over the world. It's an international comedy festival. Some years ago, I had been to the American, the premier American comedy festival, which is the Aspen, the HBO uh, Comedy Arts Festival mm -hmm. in Aspen, and I went in 1995. But uh, no international acts. This was from all over the place, yeah. from, from South Africa and from blah, 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 blah. All How many are we place. talking about? Like hundreds of people? Like hundreds, yeah. Really? Like hundreds of people. And they, wow. and they, 
and they showcase people all year long. I had uh, I had showcased for for the festival last September, and uh, and out of all that, I got wow. to go. I got to go. So it's not like just great. writing a request. I'd like to be in there. I mean, there's some no, rigor to no. get. No, I had it. been I had been showcasing for this for a number of Congratulations. years. Congratulations! That's in. awesome. Yeah, that's great. Now, primarily though, you're based here in the Twin Cities. Yes, this is where I am you work based out here of. in the Twin Cities. And for those folks who don't know, I mean, storyteller, comedian, what's that intersection all about? What What does that mean that you do both? I think a lot of people think comedy. It's you're just, standing it's up. It's just it's monologue. It really yeah. is. And my monologues tend to run. Um, to the humorous side, so that's why I had started out. I had started out in the cabaret circuit, uh, just doing doing monologues and essays, just spoken word stuff. And because my my stuff was by and large humorous, comedy was a natural. Uh, so you grew you into know, that a natural part of springboard. It. That's right. That's oh. right. I started storytelling before I had been doing it for a year before I ended oh. up writing jokes. Jo but only joke writing year. is difficult. Oh what? yeah, it's tough. But yeah. only about a year, you say. I mean, mm -hmm. So that's kind of a quick takeoff there. It is a quick takeoff. Yeah. It is a quick takeoff. But I couldn't write a joke to save my life for the first year. It was it was longer formatted stories. Yep. Steve yeah. Allen talks about comedians or, or audiences watching a comedian and they're sitting there in the audience and saying, "Oh, that's easy. I could do that." And he makes the point. No, you can't, because if you could, you'd be doing it. That's right. And you'd be living the life, you'd be making the money, you'd be famous. <laughs> yeah. It's very tough to do. Living the life. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, whatever kind of a life it is. Um, were you writing before? Is that how you got into it? Was that just writing, writing? Yeah, I was journaling. I was wow. journaling. And uh, and that's how it that's how it all came to be. It sounds no, like dangerous no, waters. No. I mean, you start journaling, and then it's storytelling, and then all of a sudden and then comedy. Just, and boom. Well, you know, and, and I'm a ham. I'm a ham. Now, where did that come from? I mean, is that, oh, were you an actor in just, high school uh, or something? No. No, no, <laughs> no. <laughs> painfully not shy. Yeah. Just uh, I, I used uh, the big line is I couldn't be popular, so I was just loud. I was the loud, heavy set, buck tooth girl. Everybody, so not really the class clown, more like okay. the class annoyance. Wow, so, mm -hmm. I found whenever I got loud, people would shun me, and then I got shy. So I went the other direction. Well, that's good for you. You like working with Twin Cities audiences? Are they good they're audiences? They're great. They're, yeah? the, they're the best audiences yeah. ever. Sure, sure. Yeah. I'm, I'm always most comfortable at home. Mm -hmm. yeah. Where Absolutely. where do you perform? I, you don't have to rattle off every club you've done, but I mean, what kind of venues do you usually show up in? I've uh, well, I've I've played in Vegas. Las Vegas? Uh, Las Vegas. To Las Insiders, Vegas. Yes. Vegas. Las Vegas. Really? Yeah. Who did you open for? I opened for someone you would never know, Monique. But maybe Monique, you would know, oh, yeah. you know Monique? Transvestite? No. Oh. No. <laughs> Who is Monique? No. <laughs> I didn't get a card. Monique. 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 The unique she, Monique. The unique Monique. She was here. She was actually here. She played uh, the strip club over there for Hanson's. Um, Wait a minute. The strip club over there. The strip. That's that's isn't that minute. Yeah, well, yeah. She played the strip club over there. Yeah, over there. For, yeah. For about a month or so, she was telling jokes with the naked gals. <laughs> Only she wasn't naked. No, you know my she, mom's watching this, and she's saying the strip club. You mean they have the, a comedy the, club she, like in a strip mall? They did or? for a while. They jokes is with an X. Jokes. It, for it was like a thing. But and I Monique, got to know and Monique, this, and she's very very funny. Okay, and she very, said, very "Come funny. on down to Vegas." She said, "She said you would do great in Las Vegas." Well, you killed in Montreal. How'd you do in Vegas? I did great. Wow. I so are great. you going so to Los Angeles? Is this like I staging ground here and then Los bam? Angeles. I have management and an agent in Las Angeles. Oh, you Angeles. do. So I why are you living here? Years. Because I love here. So you're not planning and moving. I mean, you're going to well, build a career here, if, and then if the if the if the work comes. Yeah. We'll see how it is. There's yeah. a quality of life here that I enjoy. Compared to? Compared to Los Angeles. I, I would never be able to bring up my family to the manner that they have become accustomed in <laughs> Yeah, we've in been Los hearing Angeles. stories. I have a nice, I, I live in a nice uh, neighborhood and, yeah. I, and I have nice neighbors and, yeah. and uh, there's grandparents and cousins and... and uh, well, I have talked with other comedians here based in the Twin Cities say, yes, I could go to Los Angeles, and yes, maybe I could make beaucoup more money, but I could make really good money here and have the quality of life, and right. why do I want to leave But that? maybe you couldn't. Maybe you couldn't. There's a lot out of there, it out there. And, I, and yeah. I seem to enjoy a fair amount of attention. Uh, hereabouts. Staying, staying hereabouts and over there. Oh, you do? Okay. Well, sure, sure. I get, I get to go out and do a one-woman show there every year, and I get auditions for television shows, for major television well, shows. Well, very cool. Sure, and, now, and I've had this management for the last six years, and, and I think I enjoy the same amount of opportunity mm -hmm. without the flack. Let's say they offered you a show, maybe they've been offering you shows, yeah. and you read it and you say, I don't want to do that. Right. Is that what happens? Sometimes. I mean, it's your choice? Sometimes. Yeah. yeah. And sometimes I read for something that I really want, and I don't get it. Oh. And, but that's, that's the nature of the business. Right. right. But I get to have a dog in a house. 
Here. Here. Yeah, and they don't and I wouldn't get to have Los that. Angeles anymore, I don't no, think. they don't. Yeah. No, not the not the good Minnesota dogs. What no. are, what's the inspiration <laughs> for your work? Where do you where do you come with with these inimitable stories that you tell and the humor? From every place, from every place I've ever been and every place I'll ever go. Somebody I've, said uh, to watch out if they're where you work. I know you have a, a, a another. That's right. Day job. I work at Joe's Garage. Yeah, and we're not going to plug Joe's, with. but that's a restaurant. We're not going to plug Joe's Garage that's at right. 1610 Harmon Place. But somebody said if you're their waitron, you better watch it because you might be taking some material right. right out of their life. <laughs> so no. is it like based on tips or I'm, anything? I'm working so far behind. I have so much material that I used, keep, to like, I used to be a waitress. Sure. Oh. Sure. I keep a journal. Yeah. I well, keep that's how journal. this started. That's right. Sure. I used to waitress at Mickey's Dining Car, downtown St. Paul, Paul. Mm -hmm, yeah. for six years. So I'm still working on stuff from, oh my God. from 10 years ago. Well, St. Paul, so I think, is that in I the take dictionary as four characters. That's a wild place down there. That's right, it is. If you were to describe an emotion that you work out of, is there something you work out of, a primary emotion that you bring to the stage? An emotion that I yeah. work out of? Yeah. What no, I don't, I don't understand that, fun. Phil. I don't get it. You don't? You're not working uh, out No, I don't get what you just said. That's what I'm I trying to explain now. That's right. <laughs> okay. But it's just sheer hilarity. I mean, life is just fun, and you're just putting that out in front of people? Oh, I work out of all different, uh, yeah. sure, sure, yeah. sure. The gamut. The gamut. The gamut. You know, it depends on what I'm feeling. Can you talk a little bit about comedy? I know it, in the Twin Cities, comedy started taking off in the late 70s and mm -hmm. really kind of went nuts there in the 80s. What's it like now in the latter 90s? Is it a healthy scene? Are audiences still coming? Sure. Yeah? It's a healthy scene. It's, a, it's probably better now that it's, that it's in flux because um, it, it, it keeps people working harder. Now, what do you mean by that? It keeps the, 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 the performer working harder? That's right. Yeah. That's right. It, it's going to raise this. It raises the standard. Yeah. Now, when you say it's in flux, what do you mean? I mean that uh, people don't pay. People don't pay to, to go and see comedy like they did in the, in the early 80s oh, and see. in the late 70s. The, the houses are generally papered now. You can always find a free ticket here or there. Okay. Um, but, and, the, and the club owners tend to make their money on the alcohol, on, on, the, the, on the price yeah. of the drink. Yeah. Um, but but in, in, the, in the smaller clubs um, and in the... Um, like well, the one right downtown here, Acme. Mm -hmm. Acme is on the that. riverfront. Yes, yeah. yes. I mean that just it uh, it raises the stakes for the performer. You know, you you work harder. You, you work, work hard. harder for the laugh. You work. Yeah. Um, the the club owners are are more discerning in who they in who they book. You okay. know, the, we have great shows coming into town, and it's still a great so there's affordable a big fight night out. For, yeah, there's a fight sure. for that entertainment dollar. That's right. Got to come down and see it. That's right. That's it's great. it. It, it just it makes it better for everyone eventually yeah yeah any more showcases or anything like that that you're working on well I I, I don't have anything to plug right now okay. I don't have anything to plug right now I'm going to Aberdeen Aberdeen yeah okay on the first but no. of August yeah okay mm -hmm. well wish you the best of luck there Colleen thanks, thanks for being here sure sharing no. a little bit about your career yeah keep up the good work thanks that's great now, Diane Wagner will be singing in the studio right after another clip featuring an interview and images from the Insider Art Exhibition that is now on display at the Minneapolis College of Art and Design. The video was produced by Jenny Lyon, Stephen Matheson, and Rich Shelton. Stay tuned. Uh, all my life, the only time that people have paid any attention was when I was doing things I wasn't supposed to. And now I'm doing cool things and people are paying attention. And they want, they want to have a role in it to the point where they want to purchase these things you know and that's that's way cool because when you have a long prison sentence like I do you can't really give anything back to this to the community uh, restorative justice is always just right outside of our reach but it's not now because a percentage of anything of mine that sells goes to restorative justice and that's I mean I don't know if anybody will ever know that that's the way it is but it, it's important to me.
what you're gonna do you justify you playboy girls with their cocaine smiles growing into nothing going nowhere where and then they are my boys with their possessions made of gold feeling thick as water their minds and as eyes look at me our testimony i don't want to hear you justify you don't let me in what you're gonna do who give me our testimony you can never justify you justify you justify you you justify you do you have a direction you know you cannot no you cannot when you justify you use your brain not your body or your money what if your luck runs out shot will you scream and shout you give me your testimony i don't want to hear you justify don't let me in what you're gonna do you give me your testimony you can never justify you justify you justify you you justify you you justify you justify you you justify you justify you justify you justify you justify you you justify you you justify 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 you well nice job diane wagner thanks for being here thank you that was very nice now you perform around the twin cities yep that's right, uh, fine line, I know, down in the warehouse district, Minneapolis here. Mm -hmm. You got a couple things coming up? You got something later yeah, in the month? Yeah, um, Thursday, August 27th at O'Gara's. That's right. St. Paul. And uh, you and your people were talking earlier about a big showcase you're working on for this fall. Yeah, it's the Minneapolis Music Showcase, um, eight local artists, and we're inviting national um, and our people from around the country. That's pretty good, and you guys are taking the lead on that. Yeah. Well, good for you. Yep. So Diane Wagner, look for her at a music venue near you. Now in a minute, uh, Janet will be, back, will be back to help me wrap up the show, but first, the infamous Artifacts Giveaway. Stay tuned. The Artifacts Giveaway for August, the ultimate fashion statement, the envy of the neighborhood, one cool t-shirt. It's from the Minnesota Film Board, and we've got two to give away. To win, call the City Cable 34 hotline at 673-2234. Leave your name, address, and phone number on the answer machine. Tell us you're watching Artifacts, and if you're the fifth or eighth caller to leave a message, you'll soon be wrapped in elegance. Again, the number is 673-2234. Call today. Well, that was fun. Indeed. Good guests as all, and interesting to learn about that television production. Oh, it's booming. Careers are it's being happening. built. It's happening, yeah. That's very cool. By the way, I was talking with Kay Ruane, one of my guests, mm -hmm. and um, interesting thing, her first big break, she said, she got an Arts Midwest NEA grant. This is a few years back. And, I mean, that's really nice, a nice way for her to career kind of take yep. off. But she told me that that was the last NEA artist panel Mm. that the NEA had before it got kind of shut down on those individual artist things. So I guess kind of a little bit of the history mm -hmm. in the making there. But congratulations to Kay. That was a nice thing for her to, Indeed. to win. I know you have some events. I have some events. You start. Okay, I will. <laughs> One thing that they do only every other year, it's called Sunday Afternoon on the Avenue. And what it is, it's a tour of five historic places of worship along Hennepin mm -hmm. Avenue. Uh, it includes Temple Israel, the synagogue there, Hennepin Avenue United Methodist Church, the First Unitarian Society, the Cathedral of St. Mark, and the Basilica of St. Mary in uh, Minneapolis. Now, every other year they do this, and you can walk down. It's on uh, Sunday, August 9th, uh, early this month, from 1 to 5 p.m., mm -hmm. and you can kind of wander into these, and then they have guided tours of the architecture and of the interior Ooh, of these that places. Would be so really if you've fun. never been in there, yeah. and what I've heard over the years, they draw like tens of thousands of people to wow. this thing. So it's a very cool thing to do. Sunday, August 9th, 1 to 5, uh, Sunday, Avenue on the, uh, Sunday afternoon on the Avenue. Take that in. Sounds like a good one. Uh, we want to let you know that the arts communicators are going to help everybody work more effectively with television editors. Get your arts news on television. They're doing a seminar Tuesday, August 11th from 11.30 to 1.30 at MCAD. And we've got uh, assignment editors from four of the major TV networks in town, KMSP, KSTP, WCCO, and CARE 11. Yeah, it's a good place to learn more if you want to pitch your 
ideas to these right, editors to maybe right. get a little bit of airtime. Indeed. That's good stuff. Mm -hmm. um, by the way, an old friend to the uh, Artifacts show, uh, Donna Norberg, just recently uh, was given some uh, recognition by the American Association of Community Theaters. Now, that's the national level mm -hmm. of these community theaters things. They presented its 1998 David C. Bryant Award for, and I quote, significant and valuable service to community theater. To Donna Norberg, she lives in northeast Minneapolis. Um, it's established once a year. They do this for uh, people that are really making contribution. And she was given this award uh, at their national convention out in Benton Harbor, Michigan, uh, uh. earlier this summer. She uh, also then, and probably because of that, they yep. put her on their executive board. So now she's she's working hard at the national level. Donna, way to go. So yeah, she's been a guest yeah. here on yes. Artifacts a couple of times. Indeed. Artifacts. So congratulations. That's tremendous. Very nice. Just want to let you know, if you are working in the film and video business or new media, and you want to get listed in the Minnesota Production Guide, which you should do if you're working in that business. Uh, the uh, listings forms are out in the mail right now. If you didn't get a form, you can get one from the Minnesota Film Board by calling 332-6493. Get your name listed. This is an excellent resource. Fabulous. I use it a lot and I know that in the industry it's I use great. it every day. 332-6493. Right. Um, a couple of upcoming things we wanted to mention. Mm -hmm. uh, now next month, the September Artifacts Show, we're going to have amongst the guests yes. uh, Jim and Susan Roth. They've opened up a new art gallery down uh, on mm -hmm. the Nicollet Mall and that's going to be neat. They feature Southwestern art. We're going to have them in. Mm -hmm. But also, we want to point out an event that's happening this month in August yes. uh, with Charlie McGuire. He's the singing park ranger. He He's going to be down at the Nicollet Island Amphitheater uh, Monday, August 10th at, at uh, what does it say here, uh, 7 p.m. Mm -hmm. So that's a concert you can go to. We're going to cover that. Artifacts is going to be down there um, capturing a little bit of his mm -hmm. music and talking with Charlie. So you'll be able to see and hear him next month in September on our show. How about that? Isn't this interesting? I yeah. Mean, he's a park ranger. Cool. He's Ranger Charlie. Takes his guitar. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of cool. Yeah. Those yeah. guys do good stuff. They do. All right, so uh, we're just about wrapping up here. That's right. If you've seen anybody or heard anything on Artifacts that you'd like to know a little bit more about, call our hotline, 673-2234. Get in touch with us, with us, and then we'll put you in touch with guests or the organizations they're part of. And, of course, we have our giveaway. Yay! Oh, good toss. That's right. Things are this busting is, out all over. This is, oh, extra large, Bill. Should hey, fit you. Hey, that'll <laughs> work. Give yep. me two. I'm small. <laughs> so if you want one of these, call the City Cable 34 hotline, too, and put your message on the voicemail. And if you're the right caller. That's right. You get one. Yep. We'll wing this in the mail to you. You're going to wing it. We're going to wing it. Meanwhile, grab your pens paper, pencils, crayolas, whatever you use, because we're <laughs> going to have the Artifacts calendar up mm -hmm. next. And we hope you join us next month for another edition of Artifacts. Yep. And before we go, we have Robert Bly. Oh, Robert yeah. Bly. We covered um, the uh, Midwest or the Minnesota Writers 5 event. Mm -hmm. And uh, we've got a few minutes of Robert reading a poem. So that's coming up mm -hmm. right before our calendar events. Mm -hmm. Thanks for watching Artifacts for August. I'm Janet Zahn. And I'm Phil Lindsay. We'll see you next time. You're alone. Then there's a knock on the door. It's a word. You bring it in. Things go all right for a while. But this word has relatives. <laughs> Soon they turn up. None of them work. <laughs> They sleep on the floor and they steal your tennis shoes. <laughs> you started it. You weren't content to leave things alone. Now the den is a mess and the remote is gone. <laughs> That's what writing a poem is like. You never receive your wife only, but the madness of her family. It's good. Otherwise, we could get what we want in a poem and the world would end. Thank <laughs> you.